David Zeth Myers. That's right. Good guy. Seth Myers on the show this week. Seth Myers was mm -hmm. a little after us. But I hosted when he was the head writer. That's right. And uh, it was great to write with him. He's really sharp. He's just a very nice guy, very bright, articulate young man. He is very articulate. And he seems like he has his act together. Uh, worked with some really good people and had some funny stories about a lot of them. And really good inside baseball about SNL and his own talk show. And he's done a comedy special or two. He's done a pretty well for himself, this kid. And if you look at his time on SNL, which we go over his timeline, he really bridged a lot of casts. And he was really, he was there during that. There was sort of, I think other people refer to it as the murderer's row, but he was a really good guy to have around because he was, he was around all those years, either writing for everybody, mm -hmm. performing himself or doing update. And he did it solo for many years as well. So he has a big SNL career, so this was right. a good uh, good guest for us, and and we know him. And I had fun reliving a story that I forgot about that when I hosted that we were in a sketch with Amy Poehler. Did but we talk fake... about that with Seth? Which one? Maybe we talked about it with Amy, but Seth was the director of that. He played the director. We were we were in a movie. Me and Amy and Seth is the fake director uh, in the sketch. Anyway, I don't want to give it all away. Let's just let them hear it. I know. I said I said something that you, Greg, won't be able to use, but it was on a Zoom for this thing up in the other house, and I, yeah. I said, "Yeah, I can do I can do stuff from up here." You know, I uh, last week I did Amy Poehler in the barn. <laughs> it just sounded sexy. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> So you can cut that. <laughs> you can cut, anyway, you, <laughs> I don't think anyone believes that, but it's fine. It's funny. Uh, okay, so here's Seth, guys, and we're just uh, had a nice time with him. Seth, non sequitur theater. So I did a gig <laughs> in West Virginia. Do you want a sound check? Well, I'll ask you in a second. Are you a sound check guy? No, so no. Just make it sound really good. Jay Farrell was there the night before. So I said, just give me Jay's sound. <laughs> okay, go. They off mic. Yeah, go out. And then just a huge slap back echo. If it had, if it, and I like, do I stop the show? But maybe it's the room. They can't. But that was so distracting because I would talk, but I couldn't really. It came and back. And then it talks back to you? Gar is that what it is? Garbled, yeah. So like an echo effect. Zeth Myers is our guest today. Wait, do you think that Jay Farrell likes a big slapback echo? Do you think that was on his rider? Uh, well, if you drop the echo and just go big slapback, I have no idea. No. Um, you always, I always do a sound check for this very reason. It's so rare that it's a problem. I mean, Nate Bergazzi, all these, I don't do it either. Really? Well, I will, a, I will remember to ask, is there a slapback echo? Now you will, in, sure. in this theater. It's a combination of laziness <laughs> and unprofessionalism on my end, but I just don't want to get there at three in the afternoon and go in and then I'm like, hello? And they're like, okay. See, I'm I wouldn't like, do okay. three, but I would do, I try to show up earlier. If they say be there at 6.30, I'm like, what about six for a sound check? Yeah, I wouldn't. Now, what are you looking for? Are you, how meticulous are you? Like a little more bass, a little more bass? Nothing. Okay, a little like less? That, I have oh. no taste at all <laughs> about music or sound or <laughs> lights. Bass. They ask me what for the lights. I 100% have your take on it, Dana, which is whatever the last guy had. But I just yeah. want to be there in case something. Right. And you want to be able to, because people are coming in in a casino, and I, you want to be able to kind of see them and comment. Not brightly lit, but just a little light. Yeah. Anyway, but. Uh, no, no, don't move on to the set yet. I think I learn a lot from what do you do before a stand up show. So I'm happy to talk about this. It's it's so riveting to the audience. So when I get on. They love this I, stuff. <laughs> here's another problem, Seth. You get on. And there's like a fucking wind turbine on your side of your face. I go, was Beyonce here last? Because I don't want my hair blowing to the side. And now I have cotton mouth. And I go, hey, can we turn off AC unit 104? And then no one, everyone already checked out. Once you're on stage, they all leave and go to smoke. Everyone on the crew. Okay, stand up story question. Have you ever <laughs> mistakenly been chewing gum right before you go out? And then you realize that you have bit, uh -oh. bit your tongue or the side of your mouth and you are bleeding. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome. And your mouth is bleeding. Anyone ever had that? No, nope, I've never had that. How, Seth, how many stand up dates? I mean, are you, have you been consistently doing stand up these last 20 years? 
Uh, or on and off. Yeah, on and off. I I did my special. I taped pretty much right before the pandemic. So then mm-hmm. it was good. It was good timing that I didn't have an act for the eighteen months that nobody could do an act. And then I've sort of started <laughs> after your, na- uh, your name pops up in my world sometimes. Like if I uh, Zeth, Zeth was here last week for the corporate dater, Zeth couldn't make it. Will you do it? You know. Yeah, <laughs> I hear a lot that you uh, because again, especially corporate things, Dana. You hear about people who bomb, and I always hear that you have done very well. When I ask who did it last Ooh. year, I like to always don't you always go how they do how they do. First of That's all, they're very difficult. James Austin Johnson, they. Trump extraordinary impression. He's he called me recently because he was doing some for the first time. He's like, well, how do you do these? Because you're just playing to silence and they're having a steak dinner. So <laughs> I, what I do is I go online, and I check the corporation and then I give a fake speech as if I'm knowledgeable about their economic data. And I think we can see growth in the third quarter. I just do a lot of tricks, but they love it. They love they it. They love it. You. What about you, Zeth? I was an event in New York. I think Lauren asked if uh, Bill Hader and I would do it together. He And so Bill was Stefan and I was me. And we did this charity event. And afterwards, Bill said, oh, my God, we bombed. And I was lucky enough to know, oh, no, that was great. For a charity event, we just crushed. For this, <laughs> yes. Yes. I always come off, even if I bomb. I always go, wow, that was a great audience. I had a great time. <laughs> Even if I'm dead silent, you can hit And everyone looks at They kind of go, looks around he going, thought it was does good. He, he doesn't know. Uh, I do like to do a meet and greet if I have to. I like doing it after the show because even if you thought it was rough, they will often say that was so much better than what we usually have. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We had this guy named not to be mentioned, and yeah. it was awful. Seth, here's another trick, and then we're going to talk about it. I don't even know what, but when um, <laughs> I, I get off, they go, you contractually have to do 50, let's say, you know, or an hour. <laughs> and you go, fine. And then it's bombing so badly. You get off at 51. I'm supposed to do an hour. The first thing I say is, did I go too long? And they go, oh. No, actually, I go, oh, my God, thank God. I was like, I thought it was like an hour and a half. And they're like, no, no, it was actually, it was a little short. Oh, thank you. Okay, good. And they're like, wait. <laughs> I did. Because one. they don't have to pay well, you. sometimes they get excited and they want your entrance to be. And I go, that only buys me 10 seconds. This is amazing. So it's a car show. They got me a go-kart and I'm supposed to go through the audience. <laughs> I go, it's not. And the cra- and the music is like Metallica. And I'm in the car, whoa, you know, and then. The music comes down. I step out of the car and it's the biggest womp, womp. You know? <laughs> now what? Do you come Clown? on to music, Zeth? Ladies and gentlemen, or do you come out, just walk out? I usually walk. They usually play. And again, I just have no taste for this. They'll sometimes just play like five seconds of, of the opening credits for, for late night. But mm-hmm. I will say, oh. and if any uh, corporate planners are listening, <laughs> nobody at a corporate event wants more than 45 minutes. And I know they That's want true. their money's worth and they think give us an mm-hmm. hour. Nobody at a corporate event. Oftentimes we're going on and the next thing is they all get to have dinner and drinks together and t- talk to their colleagues. And it doesn't matter how red hot the comedian is. An hour is too long at a corporate event. I've had 100%. in the early days, they'd say 70 and a 10 minute meet and greet. And then it got down to some of them were 30 to 45 and like a half hour meet and greet. It became more about me being a museum piece at this point in my existence on the planet. Sure. So they yeah. want to get the picture with the guy from the, Early, early, late 70s. You're right, Seth. It's hard to, to say you're paying a lot. I'm telling you, yes. even 30 is a lot, but do 45. Yes. Not the, the last 15 will be horrifying, but you'll do it. And then, and they, all they want to do is, you're right. If they have something after, or they just want to talk, they're drinking. Yeah. And if you're a surprise and they're like, at the end of your eight hour meeting, we have an extra hour tacked on of someone you, and they're like, I heard it was Gwen Stefani. And I walk out and they go, what the fuck? And then they go, oh, okay. And then I do it. And they're like, they all rush to the bar. <laughs> and it is true. You're right. David, because you want to say like, I'm not, I'm not saying this because I'm lazy. I, it's only yes. minutes out yeah. of my day. I can do it. I'm just doing it for you and your people. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. They get up at six. The open bar is at five. They yes. see me at 10. That's you know. Uh, uh, anyway, we don't. I have a real question for Seth. Them. Let's start the program, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. No. Aside from what Seth, I have to say, looks great. And I, whatever you're doing on Zoom, I I need to do it. He's I need got to a, you helicopter a nice your team out. Mm-hmm. He looks tan. He's clear. I can hear him. I look like fuck pie. I don't know. I shouldn't even be on this Zoom. I you got to have the camera up. We're going to talk later. But 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 Seth has a little bit of scruff. 
Yeah, a little scruffy. L- let me ask you a question. So you've just been, for someone who's been working nonstop for 20 years at an extremely high level, so the strike hits, yes. was this your longest break? I mean, you had pandemic breaks, but then there were Zoom stuff, but this was probably your longest break in like 20 years or something? I mean, I- Yeah, definitely, because the pandemic, we immediately went back to doing the show. So I was alone, but I was working. Yeah. Oh. And so this was, the only thing that was close was the last strike, which was 100 days And this was, you know, 100, almost 150. So this was nuts. The difference between this time and last time is I have three kids. So it didn't really feel like a break. I would say that my time was uh, used very well. And I did try to get out and do shows because I liked being in front of an audience. But it was a very, very strange, long break from being. Also, the entirety of my career has taken place in 30 Rock. So it was weird to not be in this building. How long do you do you not? This is a good one. How long do you not tell? How long do you not tell your wife and kids there's a strike so you can just leave at a certain time in the day and just go to wherever you want? And then they finally go, wait, you're not even going to work anymore. You go. All I right, think I could. Have, I mean, up. I think I could have made it a full month before. <laughs> That's good. Certainly, That's good. none of them watched the show, so it would have been that. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Are you amazed? Because I, I assume it's accelerated. I don't know what your childhood was like, but just how integrated the parent is with the child in modern parenting. Um, I think it's just systemic and it's it's just environmental. But yeah, it's it's not like your dad or my dad. There were five kids and we barely saw them. Do your yard work and get the hell out, that kind of stuff. Everyone knows that. But when you're home with three kids, are they because you have three, are they have an ecosystem of entertaining themselves? They, they, you know, they're just still a little young, but the two boys, so it's seven, five, and two. And so the two oh, boys two, are, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're they're kind yeah. of uh, entertaining themselves a little bit. The It was both good and bad that the strike fell during the summer because it was good because, you know, obviously that's a better time to not be going into an office. And it was bad because they just didn't have school. So they were just around the whole time. And uh, that's mm. why I started multiple podcasts, just to have a reason to tell them to be quiet daddy's working oh right now you have your podcast you have you have one solo and then you have the five tenors yeah so i do i do uh one with my brother called <laughs> family trips at the myers okay. brothers and yeah then strike yes. five which will be wrapping up <laughs> the strike basically ended because people collectively decided they didn't want our podcast to keep <laughs> was that factor Where, in? who thought of the who <laughs> thought of the name because it does it's it's pithy i don't know what you would call it strike force five i mean it is I'm going to guess all John Oliver. No, it was Colbert. I think it was Colbert. Mm. And it was originally just the name of our text chain that we started in the run up to the strike because we did want to make sure we were all on the same page knowing that it was likely to happen. And so uh, that was the name of the text chain. And then Kimmel had the idea for the podcast. And we uh, realized that it was we already had a very good name. Mm. And you're the only 1230 in the bunch, right? I'm the only 1230 in the bunch. And also, the, the, thank you for saying 1230, when in reality now, I think it's 1237, which is even more embarrassing to say. <laughs> you know, yeah. When you tell somebody you're on a show that starts at 1237, it sounds like. Why does that happen for the regular viewer? I think it's about the affiliates and station breaks and stuff and the local news and all really thrilling things. But yeah, it's all gotten pushed back a little bit. Do you, I mean, the... Um, when I'm watching your stuff on YouTube and you have these gigantic amount of hits and stuff, it seems like, I mean, obviously it's looser at 1230. It se- if all things being equal, it seems better to be doing your show at that time. As far as more fun, yes. I, I don't know the, the financial part of it, but it does seem just loose. That one hour later, you just yes. got freedom, right? I mean, well, yeah, I think it also helps that you're on after, and I don't think that, uh, Jimmy Fallon's not having fun. I think he's having a lot of fun too, but I think the network's paying a great deal more attention to his show than our show. Mm-hmm. And so that just gives you the freedom to do what you want, especially after the COVID break where we didn't have an audience. We were just doing a show for almost 18 yeah. minutes without a live audience. And we kind of kept using those instincts as we uh, got the audience back. And so the show's been very loose and very fun to do. It's one of the reasons I you know, didn't go back to wearing a suit is it just seemed like, oh, you know, I'm going to let people know when they tune in that we're, we have a little bit 
more of a laid back vibe about what we're trying to get done here. You're the Fetterman of the, uh, the strike force. I was the first guy there. <laughs> I was the first guy there. Although Fetterman <laughs> makes me look like I'm in a tuxedo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, so the, uh, the, the stress of being the head writer at SNL and all that. And then when you, when they approached you, you can tell if you, if you have a Lauren, uh, to do this show, you know, you're, you're the host and is it four nights a week? Yeah. Is it, is it easier or harder or you're still figuring out how compared to being the head writer at SNL and then being in a lot of sketches? I will say this was very hard when it started, but it's easier now because unlike SNL, where each week a different host comes in and completely changes the DNA of the week. We now every week we're trying to make our show and everybody here is sort of rowing in the same direction. Whereas the thing about SNL and especially being the head writer is it just never got easier. I think you maybe got a little bit better at it, but the headaches that would come up on any given week, you just couldn't get out in front of them. There was never a way to, you know, make it uh, a foolproof. It's and almost so, impossible and you, that it gets it stays as hard as it does, but it does. Yeah. And and you're also you feel like you're in service to an institution and you you don't want to sort of besmirch its legacy and you're working for Lauren, you know, having to uh, see Lauren every day is just in general harder than not having to see Lauren every day, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. because, because he can't be everywhere <laughs> giving notes to everything. Yes. I mean, I well, we're in a very nice position where I mean, I think also, you know, uh, you guys uh, have spoken of Shoemaker, you know, with me and Shoemaker working on the show, like we're two people that Lauren sort of turned to a lot in our tenure at SNL. And so I think he has a lot of confidence in us. And, and so we don't have to he doesn't feel the need to check in with us on a day to day level. And you know how he thinks. Yes. Slow. And how, and how he talks. <laughs> yes. Like when you're when, when I was there and you're the head writer, I just noticed how, just. And I met with Jim Downey, too, but you were just in every, involved in every sketch, basically, and overriding and doing. And just a funny little anecdote from me. When I was hosting earlier, I don't know, if it was 98 or 2000. Tina was assigned to do church chat with me because Lauren will do church chat. You know, he just tells you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. All right. And then she would do the church lady when we were in the office writing. And then 10 years later, I'm doing it. You're going to help me with it. And then you would do a church lady impression when you were writing jokes as a church lady. And uh, I don't want to say who did it better. Mm -hmm. uh, you're both great. But uh, <laughs> that was you had a you had a very good ear for the lady. Let's put it that way. That was a real I mean, there are many surreal things that happen in your time at that show, especially if you're someone who grew up watching the show. But that uh, is very high on the list. Uh, spending that week with you where, well, you know, not only do we get to work on a uh, church chat, but also a uh, Wayne's World. That was a real, <laughs> that was a real trip where uh, I was definitely pinching myself the whole time. When you went back to host, did they did they have things they want you to do? Or well, you, I had a very kind of different free? time at the show than you, Dana. In that, <laughs> <laughs> well, you had your your update segments and all. Yeah, all that's that about stuff. all I had. I felt. I will say, I have no proof except for how late they asked me i do get the sense that someone dropped out <laughs> fallout boy yeah. and then you know because yeah. i was like we usually i feel like we knew the host before the sunday night uh, <laughs> and uh, before John, can you John run over John here and be in 30 sketches and i you know I was, I was doing this show we had to cancel a week of the show which was no big deal and i was very excited to host i'd been gone i only think about three years but there was literally nothing i did that anybody wanted to see me do again other than update and you know i did start as a cast member and sort of worked my way into being a writer and the guy on update so they had already tried me and sketches and it had been a right. failed experiment so you I went did, backwards i felt i felt for the writing staff the week i came in who had to figure out a thing that had already been tried and not figured out i had a wonderful <laughs> well, but, <laughs> what, did you did just you do an hour long update player? sorry go what's ahead. that <laughs> <Did you? laughs> he he came in and, and to host and just did an hour of update you'll do update <laughs> good night <laughs> You came in as a feature or a full-fledged cast member? No, I was a feature. I started uh, with Amy Poehler uh, and then Dean Edwards and, and Jeff Richards were in my class. And we were oh, all, yeah. yeah, we were featured. I was featured for two years. And I had a real, either first or second summer, I had one of those, like, you're, you were, they're not, they're not picking you up yet. You know, one of those. Oh, yeah. Uh, where, 
I know that they, tune. It, where they basically, I mean, they are saying, David knows. Not gonna, they haven't decided on you yet. What they're going to do is look at every other funny person. <laughs> and, they're doing uh, a tour long, of Second City, the improv. Yeah. As long as they don't find one person they like more, you're good. <laughs> and when did you uh, accelerate? When did you take over the show, essentially? I, well, I mean, I, I definitely benefited from Tina's departure, but I sort of, I would say really sort of gutted through the first five and a half, six years on the show. But when Tina left, and again, I was, you know, I wasn't at the rewrite table. I was just a cast member. And then Lauren called me in and asked me if I wanted to be a writing supervisor for Tina's last year. And that was the first mean? That's sort of like a right underneath the head writer. So, but I ran a table. I was one of the people who ran a table. Oh, okay. And that was the first time I felt like I had added any value to the show that they couldn't go find elsewhere. The thing for me, and again, I'm not being hard on myself, but when I, I wrote a lot of things for group sketches where other people would be in them. And the longer I was there, the more really funny people showed up like Hader, Sandberg, Sudeikis, Forte, Fred. And they were this kind of guy, every one of them could do my best move better than me. And so as a writer, I would rather put Bill Hader in my sketch than me. And so if I felt that way, I certainly knew the rest of the writing staff felt that way too. So that was why it was very nice for me to find my way into head writer. And then of course, update. Longest running update until Colin took over. These two guys. Yeah. Yeah. Blew me out of the water, these two. So you were there 12 years, 13 years so, yeah, at and SNL. Yeah, 12, 12 and a half years. And first five tough, and then you became head yeah. writer and then update guy extraordinaire. Yeah. Well, I mean, I felt very, I felt at home then in a way that I, if late night hadn't popped up, I didn't have really an exit strategy. I was very, in a way that probably wasn't good, I became content at SNL. Does Lauren have all... What what does he have there? He has your studio, which is called what nine or something. We're eight G. Eight G. He has eight H. It's got to be yeah. some expensive real estate there. Does yeah. he have anything else? Was that Conan's? Fallon's downstairs. He's six. Oh right. Oh, six B. Yeah. Is that right? He is. Yeah. I was in, I was in six A in nineteen eighty one. Oh, doing sit- your show? Uh, sitcom with Mickey Rooney and Nathan Lane, one of the boys. All oh, right. And <laughs> I was in six A, in, in Rockefeller Center for six months. What a bummer there's no sitcoms in 30 Rock anymore. That would be such a fun thing to have. Was 30 Rock the sitcom in 30 Rock? No. 30 Rock was it a... Silver Cup? Yeah, that's right. Oh! Is that in Queens? Yeah. We owned a piece of that, David. If you're... Oh, you're from Queens? I'm from Normal Parents. It's from someone's act. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was crowd work when I was doing stand-up. <laughs> that was a good work. line. <laughs> <laughs> so when you... Um, I could ask you a lot of different questions. One is, uh, how did day drinking come about? I mean, because oh. that is that is un- unbelievably not inter- your day inter- drinking, but the sketch. day drinking the segment, the sketch where yeah. Zeth goes with celebrities and they get kind of drunk. It's incredibly yeah. entertaining. Uh, it's like <laughs> to watch. Yeah, it is. You know, it. The interesting thing is, I think having a, uh, the late night show and. Uh, you know, having watched a lot of Conan, uh, uh, certainly when I was in college and the man on the street stuff that Conan did, I aspired to do that as well. And I had so much anxiety being in public, uh, doing the show and that lack of control and, and knowing you had to sort of find it as opposed to have it planned ahead of time. It's all edited. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta shoot eight hours to get like one segment. Yes. And you have to talk to, and for every funny person you find, what the audience doesn't see is the eight weirdos where it was sort of aggressive or strange or, or just dry. And, uh, with day drinking, uh, I sort of drink away my anxiety about it. Like anybody with sort of a, a, <laughs> you know, so, a social anxiety and it becomes a lot more fun and we actually don't have to cut it down as much as you'd think. But the first time I did it was with my brother and we just thought it'd be a fun thing to do because I like doing stuff with my brother. And it was Retta, uh, the wonderful actress, comedian said, oh, I want to do that. And we never thought it'd be a thing we would do with guests, but because Retta did it and it was so much fun we kind of got more people signed on. And now, well, you know, people ask all the time to do it and we have to be a little bit, we try to be a little, uh, uh, what's the word, cautious with how often we do it because it is, I am drinking an amount that as I get older, I probably uh, should not do often. How do you keep up with some of these guys? There's a couple of guys I won't say who, but I'm sure they could 
drink you under the table. No, no. The only person, the only person who I think left me in the dust was Rihanna because at the end of that, she definitely was going out. Like that was like the beginning of her night, and it was uh, uh, most assuredly the end of mine. Yeah. <laughs> So um, nobody's I, driving because you know, it's New York. So there's no. It's New York. So everybody's safe and sound. Yeah, yeah that's good. That's a weird bit that I can't believe people do. And it's a, it's a What's great What's that idea hot sauce do. one on YouTube? You do hot sauce. Hot ones. Get, hot, have you guys done hot ones? I I, I will not do hot ones. That's a compelling. Uh, I did hot ones. I think it's wonderful. I think that guy's a really good interviewer. And I think the hotter the wings get, the less you're capable of editing your own answers. So it's yes. very, it's very smart. Because you're in pain, and so the anxiety yeah. is supplanted with with agony, genuine pain. <laughs> oh yeah, I don't. I, I it's funny because most of my interviews, I just want to like have a nice time. <laughs> <laughs> you're very, you're an outlier. <laughs> I'm so weird. Uh, oh, you know, I saw Dana. I'll tell Seth. You'll like this. I did a show at Town Hall the other night. When this airs in 2026, uh, right, right? We'll just say it, 20. But uh, I did town hall. It was great. And um, who's who comes back? Kenny Amon. Did he really? Oh, yeah, isn't that great? Producer. Prince he of the was city. in the audience. I I think I was talking about something we talked about on the show. We mentioned him a lot, and then I emailed him, and then he said, "I heard you're coming to town, David." And I said, uh, "Yeah, he goes, yeah, I'd love to come with the wife." So I got him in half price, took care of him, and uh, he came in. <laughs> and then then he came back after he was hesitant to he said he didn't want to bother me and then he came back he's exactly kenny among super fun we talked about that sinead o'connor thing uh, yeah Dana, that i said i said how much of what i say on the show is a lie what do you think what's the percentage and he said you got the sinead o'connor one a little wrong and i go oh he still has the picture yeah Him. now i will i will admit david when i heard you tell that on your uh, show i knew you were a little wrong because kenny had told me that story so i'm many telling times. you i you know you remember something back whatever it wasn't that far off, so we talked about it. So there was, she did rip up the picture. That part was true. <laughs> I saw that, yeah. And then I walked out. Uh, I picked up a piece. That's true. I kept it. He never got it back from me is one problem, he said. He said oh. he brought me in and said, I heard you have a piece. And I said, yes, because I was bragging to the office. And then he said, we're going to need it back. And I guess I didn't give it back. And then he, there was a legal problem. He tried to get it back from a current affair. And then he got it. And then he said, uh, then he kept it. He had it for Joe Pesci monologue. I guess they still didn't have my piece. I don't know what I was thinking. I was terrified of my job. Why Why in God's green earth did I not bring it back in? And he said, it wasn't a very important piece. It was a lot of like white. And I go, okay, then relax. It's important. It was a good, <laughs> solid piece. And oh, then he has it now. And Lauren asked him for it. And he said, no. <laughs> yeah, Lauren asked him for it for that touring sort of SNL uh, museum exhibit they were doing. And uh, and good old Kenny shot him down. And I will say, <laughs> you know, who shot Kenny? Lauren probably. Down? <laughs> but that's the thing. And I, by the way, Kenny got. You know, Kenny had to bear the brunt of Lauren's whimsy for the entire run he was at the show. The amount of time I sat there when we would do picks on you know Wednesday night, mm -hmm. and Lauren wouldn't be able to choose between two, and he'd look at Kenny and say, you know, can we do both? And Kenny would be like, we we don't have the space, Lauren. We physically don't have the space. And Lauren's like. You'll figure it out. And just like poor Kenny would have to like go. <laughs> of course. He did so, seem uh, anxious. I mean, such a nice guy, but he did seem, his, his, his eyes job. were wide open and he was on the move during show week. You could tell yes. that he was trying to He figure was the out. guy getting everything done. He was the guy getting everything done. But I will say, because he did look like, he's the way you wanted a guy in a control room for a live TV show to look. Arms mm -hmm. crossed, you yeah, know, just focus. worry lines. But when a show was over and Kenny took you aside and told you he loved a sketch you'd done, that meant more than almost anybody because yeah. you realized that for, for it to actually break through his wall of anxiety and bring him any joy, <laughs> it had to be a, a genuinely funny piece of comedy. And he's seen 2,000 million shows. What was the hardest yeah. thing you ever felt that you landed there? Uh, would it be a certain uh, update piece or a sketch? Or I wrote the Amy Tina uh, Palin Clinton sketch, and that's the hardest anything played in the room, you know. And and Ooh. that was great because I didn't have any performance anxiety about it. I I had sort of written this thing that was then in the hands of these two incredible performers. So that is one of the few times in my run at the show where I just sort of stood on the floor knowing that it would go great and just got to sort of bask in that reaction. The other thing about it, 
because it was just an in one. You know, I think sometimes when you write something on the show, your fear after it plays great address isn't that the actors will get it wrong, but maybe Lauren made you cut something and you're just worried about the shot being late. Because again, yeah. it's not the director's fault, but they're calling these shots so fast. And I was always so frustrated when a sketch went great at dress if anybody wanted to make a change. because Or the just audience like, was tough. You don't know what's going to happen. Or it's yeah. after following something and something for some reason, it steps on some jokes and you're like, oh my yeah. God, I never saw that coming. If, you, right, if right. something kills a dress and then it bought a line of yours in, in a, an ensemble piece and then later on you find out that you didn't step into the light or it was turned away so the camera wasn't on you. Yeah. And you realize later, well, it wasn't my fault, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's a, that's the torture of SNL. But when it works, like, uh, did you sit with um, Tina? Did you know she had a, a really great impression and rhythm and also sort of a lookalike element? Did you sit with her a little bit and then write the sketch or you just assumed she would do I, it? I think that was uh, that was the first one. And in the subsequent ones, uh, we we worked on them more together. But she was doing 30 Rock at the time. So there wasn't mm -hmm. like there wasn't a lot of free time in her schedule. I think people forget that she wasn't a full cast member at the time. She was True. actually juggling those two yeah. things. And then once it became what it became, I mean, again, I think we only did six, but I think we did, you know, six in sort of a nine week period. Um, uh, she and I both had this fear that they would get worse. And and somebody would say they were getting worse. So we kind of uh, redoubled our efforts to keep it um, good. And, and that was where, you know, not just Tina as a performer, but having Tina as a writer on those was uh, was invaluable. Um, I I can see Russia from my house. But now I got to own it up. You know who wrote that line? Lauren. <laughs> Shoe, Shoemaker. Among? Shoemaker. Oh, who? Shoemaker, really? Shoemaker oh, line. that's a great prop to give mm -hmm. Shoemaker. Shoemaker it was hard. It was it was heartbreaking because we were it was um, Saturday morning <laughs> and we're all at the update table where we we're sort of picking the jokes. So we get in, we would get in. I think at eleven thirty on Saturday morning to start going through the update jokes. And I had the sketch out and was just going through it one last time and uh, sort of asking the room for jokes. And uh, Shoemaker said, um, "I could see Russia from my house." And it was just, you immediately knew, oh, that's the best line, and that'll be the one that gets quoted oh, forever. Oh, God damn, yeah. what a and short, it was, concise. Oh, good it for him. Perfect. Memorable. It's, per it's perfect, perfect comedy writing. The thing yeah. about um, political impressions is that the, the audience still is coming on to the person. So, like, Sarah Palin walked out the Republican convention, first time everyone saw her. I don't know how soon after you guys did that, but it seemed like as the season went on, she kept doing meet the press or whatever she was doing. And so the audience was getting more and more familiar. They're so feeding. probably they, if I remember them all landing really hard, yeah. at least that's uh, of the, yes. the Palin. Palin was like Ross Perot. I always say to people, a fully formed comic character, uh, just coming right out of the box. You didn't have to go not got to do it or try to find a way to make it funny. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so that it was, it's great when great writing meets a great performance. And then the, the, the moment for Sarah Palin on Saturday Night Live. It's like a peak moment on the history of SNL, yeah, I think. It's very true. Yeah. And then there are other times where it's it's uh me playing John Kerry where none of those things happen. <laughs> there was no <laughs> there, was, there was no way. I mean, John Ooh. Kerry just that, you know, there's not tough, that much tough, there. Tough to get a hook. Yeah. Um, I had a line. He looked like the the tree from the Wizard of Oz. So I would just do that and say, "That's John Kerry." Are you saying yeah. my apples don't? You know that I just you just make up something. But no, he was which tough. is good. Which is like that's a very good like stand up approach. But with this, when you have to do a guy for Ugh. six sketches, it just you run out of moves. I mean, you start with no moves and you run out. And it's funny because I remember during the <laughs> Palin year, there was a lot of press around SNL and I would do interviews and and people would say, it just seems like every election year SNL comes alive. And I would say, not every. <laughs> not every. Gary, you, know, I like you start with nothing and, yeah. and it runs out from there. Well, also, you know, George W. Bush was funny and Will, was Will there in 2004 still or someone else took it over? Will? No, Will was gone. Or, so it was Will Forte, Forte was doing but Bush. But that was a funny And character. so neither, he and I could find no purchase at that point. That was, I mean, I think six, five people did Bush after yeah. uh, Farrell left. And, and again, you're following a guy who 
Because his his Bush was almost as much feral as Bush, right? <laughs> yeah, because uh, so... once you once somebody identifies the hooks, then yeah, it's hard to stay away. And election Bush was sort of a more likable Bush before you're doing, you know, Iraq, uh, you know, Iraq War Bush, which is then like people don't like him, and they also miss Will Ferrell. There was a lot stacked up against you when you were trying to do it. <laughs> and then you come in with Kerry. Did did anybody Jim Jow- Downey give you any kind of catchphrase? Yeah, Downey for- was Downey was helpful, <laughs> and uh, I mean Downey and, and and I'm John Kerry. I mean I don't have a clue how to do that. Daryl. Hammond was also would come and try to help, but it wasn't, uh, you know, that's like it's a weird like like Daryl Hammond trying to help somebody like me with an impression would be like um, LeBron James trying to teach me how to dunk like you dunk like this. <laughs> You'd be like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I don't I don't have any of those parts. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. You're Hugh Grant. Passable. Uh, passable also, you, you have a passing <laughs> resemblance to Hugh Grant. You're well, that's like the, what helps. That's it. I'm do... passing. <laughs> no, but you had, you, I know, well, it's a podcast. You can do it or not, but you, I think you have one of the best ones. Uh, do, do, uh, no, no, I'm uh, frankly, frankly, uh, 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 sorry. Uh, 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 that was it. That was just a guy. Who couldn't, uh, <laughs> but I did audition though. with it. I, had, I did audition with Hugh Grant, so I have a, a special place in my heart. Uh, for you Ryan. just do that much and you get applause and that's about it. That was it, in and out. People don't know that you get a sign like they're spade. You're going to be this and this. And, and then you've got like an hour before we do. But it doesn't mean you're doing a good impression. It's mean you're going to rely on hair, makeup and an outfit and then get something close and just get through a sketch. Whose idea was Dylan and Tom Petty for you guys? I think um, that was us. Was that you? I did Tom Petty when I was in I the did app. Dylan... At update, he'd done a concert. He had the hat, and he was. I think Bonnie Turner might have, and Terry may have suggested that. I yeah. think probably um, because they knew I, I can't did believe Petty. someone he, remembers he it. It was a very memorable. It sort of seared in my mind the uh, the cut to the two shot of you because you had such that your facial position for Tom Petty was so. Funny, Spade. which he doesn't stand up. So he owned that. He was already yeah. right. With that sounds look. weird. He sounds a little like Dylan. A funny two shot. Just a look. The look again. That's a classic example. A look is funny. Well, they were. It was also the sort of. Uh, it was apex petty look. Mm-hmm. Right, those like little glasses. Mm. A lot of hat work was going on for both guys. <laughs> so I had. I uh, took that hat from. I the remember that guy fondly. who worked the valet at the Marriott Marquis in downtown, and it was a. I had that hat forever. D- Dylan was easy to do a hacky Dylan, but you know, I don't Have you listened to Dylan lately on his albums and stuff? It, which yeah, I, yeah. I love uh, old Dylan, but it's very different. It's soon after midnight, I have a date with a fair queen, <laughs> you know, but then it was just, Hey, man, you know, all that 60s stuff. Uh, not my best moment, but thanks for bringing it up, Seth. Do you know, have you ever seen that photo that floats around the internet every year uh, that posts a photo of the Traveling Wilburys and how old they were when they were in the Traveling Wilburys? No, and it's heartbreaking it? how, like just so young. Oh. I think Roy Orbison was the oldest and he was maybe like 42. Right. 42, <laughs> I know. They say that Golden Girls were all 26. That's true, that? that's true. A lot of, there a lot of hair and makeup work in there Carol too. O'Connor, when he did All in the Family, was 15. <laughs> 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 He looked like they shit. They were two other guys. Yeah. There were two other guys it is in his funny. suit. They, when they go, the Sinatra the said, I did it my way, he was 27. I go, yeah, see? a little yeah. early, and Frank. Okay, live a little more life before you go I, down everyone's, that road. Everyone's living longer and everyone's getting, it's not so terrifying to be, I guess, I mean, you always think you look like shit and then 10 years later, you're like, oh, I looked great back then. You yeah. Know, it's tough. You just know, however bad you look now. It's just it's going to be great in worse. 10 years. God yeah, damn. we're all, we're God, stacked yeah. like a decade apart without putting numbers down. So it is kind of funny. If they in a side zoom. story. I'm <laughs> suing age, Zoom, by the way. It's 10 years later and then it's 10 yeah. years later. And then we go yeah. to, but I look to Keith Richards, you know, quit smoking at 80. And he feels great. <laughs> um, you <laughs> know, a lot of my nine. heroes, like uh, heroes, whatever, you know, uh, <laughs> Jack Nicholson, Redford, all these people, Jane Fonda hey. are in their mid 80s now. It's the weirdest, I mean, of those guys you just said, it is, um, Jane Fonda looks outstanding. Yes. 
And uh, I do want to give a shout out to how well um, that uh, that that person has aged. Just exceptional. And as a performer, work, just, Frankie and Great was a really yeah. You know, she's I just did there. something Very with uh, Christy Brinkley, and unsurprisingly, she's stunning. Yeah, sixty nine. Don't people want to be instead of? Would you rather have someone say, "Oh, uh, he's he's looking really good for his age," or "He's hot"? Would you like to be called hot still, David? Oh, Spade, mm-hmm. he's hot. But I didn't from a get, woman. I never got that ever. So yeah, I'll take fucking any scraps <laughs> yeah, you got. How would you like to be described, Seth? <laughs> Seth is mad. I have what he reached wants. the age, and this is not this has <laughs> not come from a place of self doubt, but I have reached the age where if someone said I was hot, I would think something is wrong with them. <laughs> You know what I mean? Whereas good, you look good for your age, I could take as a sort of value judgment that I can put in my pocket and feel good about, but you look hot. I, mean, like, I think on. what most people do is compare themselves to the stepdad on stepdad porn and just see how you look, you know, compare just right. looks wise, not wiener wise. Anyway, we're going to look oh, at a clip. Stepdad porn. Um, I knew I just <laughs> won a thousand dollars that was going to be mentioned during this podcast. <laughs> Thank you. I, know. I was getting into it going, I got to, I don't, I'm, shouldn't I do that? I just shouldn't do that. Also, I'm, I'm almost certain no one searches for it by that. You know, I think they might, I think I would imagine you lean into stepdaughter yeah. when you do in the search bar, mm-hmm. but that's, that's not here You know, here step, uh, you know what mother daughter porn is not mother daughter. I mean, in a perfect world, but it's, uh, it's actually just actresses. <laughs> they have an <laughs> ingenue good. and a grizzled vet. Anyway, right. let's look at a clip. Ha- By the way, uh, who also that grizzled vet? Probably younger than Roy Orbison. <laughs> exactly. Grizzled <Robert. laughs> vet in porn is like 36. They're like, I've, I've, I've done 3 million films. Uh, did you guys ever do a porn related sketch? Because Neilan and I did one. <laughs> Ridiculous. I think it bombed. A porn related sketch on SNL. Oh, man. I, there were definitely some in my time. I'm trying to think if I worked on any of them. But I don't think so. Neil and I were like in barber chairs with our shirts off and we were porn stars and people were working on manscaping or curating our, and it was like, yeah, put a little fence down there, make it nice for the people, fluff it up. It was all this abstract. That's all we had. It bombed here and it bombed then. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The one that was great uh, in my era that I had nothing to do with was uh, Vanessa Bayer and Cecily Strong were former porn stars who would do commercials for like Svorsky, uh, Svarsky Crystals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was always, they would always pronounce the the name wrong and uh, they were really dead eyed. Their performance was was charmingly dead eyed, charmingly pornish. <laughs> yeah, and then they're both uh, just such funny performers. But that was those sketches really are, were really made me laugh. Yeah, there's so does that many. answer your question, Dana? Well, Keenan yeah, had the best know. answer about who's the greatest cast member. You know, everyone likes to make rankings for sure, sure. albums and everything. And he said the women, all, oh, all that's the a good women, answer. Answer. because when. When Nora Dunn was there and Jan Hooks and Victoria, Jan- there was it was much more male dominated. Uh, yeah, some yeah. of it is because of uh, men in politics, so forth and Julia so on. Julia Sweeney, yeah. but then it seems starting with Sherry O'Terry or Vanessa and others, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then it kept building into, you know, I just Tina and Amy and Maya. Maya and, yeah, we had Tina, Amy, Maya, and, and Wig. That's at like one point. crazy. Oh, that's fucking, yeah. to have those yeah. four in a cast together. Yes, and Dratch was yeah. there Dratch for some of that. Always so she score. was yeah. funny. Yeah, there was um yeah there was a real sense that um in those era that era there was there was literally nothing they couldn't do, and and sort of yeah. late in the week. And then you add Bill Hader and Sudeikis and Fred Armisen yeah. and, and Will Forte. You know, that era that you straddled, um, I don't we know. We had a killer it, run. It, I would say that like to that when, you know, we're talking about that, uh, uh, you know, the Sarah Palin stuff. Like the cast um, at that time with Tina sort of coming back and popping in mm-hmm. was uh, was definitely the strongest top down. And it was small. You know, one of the things, and I feel bad you know, I'm obviously happy for them that they're all on SNL. But, you know, sometimes when the cast gets to 20 people, it's really hard for people to break through. And we were only about 10 or 11 at one point, And that was yeah. a really nice. That's number. rare because we got big in ours. And, and, and to have it go backwards is very rare. They just usually add. 
Yeah. We had seven, so everybody got to be on the show a oh, lot. All the birds got fed. How do you get yeah. relaxed on the show? How do you get good on the show without being on the show? So you're right. When it's 20 and you have cast members, don't blame them. Well, why leave something that you're brilliant at staying 10, 12, 13 years? People are on the junior varsity, you know, for so long, but I guess it's just, just the way it is, you know? That, because I think part of it is you do sometimes just need to get assigned a thing or two a week mm -hmm. where you get the rep without having to necessarily kill. Mm -hmm. You know, those big political sketches where you get thrown, you know, the you know, some senator at a panel yeah. and you have a few hours, <laughs> but you just get in front of the camera and you get to learn cards and other people are going to have the big laughs and people watching at home want to find those new people they can root for mm -hmm. and they have to see you in order to root for you. And you get the butterflies out of the way because they always come, yeah. but at least you get a feel for how sickening it is to actually walk 10 feet on camera and turn your turn to face the camera and you go, oh my God, this is horrible. The other thing, Danny, you know when you do it, and especially at the beginning, you just do your bit and get some laughs, and you walk off, and everyone's doing their job, and you're standing in the hallway going, did like five million people just see that? I don't even know. I'm just- Yeah. I never really would think about it. It went out uh, live. It's over. So, Zeth, I want yeah. to ask you two things in a minute, whether you would ever uh, become the executive producer of the show, because your name's been great. tossed around. Great, great. And one is, uh, my theory is about- the longevity, and there's probably 10 metrics to this, but one is when you see an athlete or an actor try to do live sketch comedy, you're watching a reality show. And then when you yeah. see people who are never heard of them, never seen them, they're just coming on SNL and you're watching them get their big break is another reality show. So that's, I don't know if it's whoever thought of the show, but it when SNL has a bad show, like say a football player is bombing or whatever, yeah. It's still really compelling. And that's yes. kind of not, I mean, a bad show for me watching it is pretty compelling because watching the cast member know it's bad, but holding up the, the, the you know, so anyway, why do you, why do you think 50 years? I'm, I'm sure you're asked all the time. I am. Well, I, it's interesting because I think that even though it's compelling, people would still criticize the show for being bad the week that an uh, athlete was bad mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, an actor ate it. But I will say a few years after I left, there's this really funny writer on the show who's not there anymore either, Mike O'Brien. And Mike and I were back sitting in an office and the current writers were complaining about how bad the host was that week. And it was a major movie star who was sort of being impossible and they were all in such a bad mood, but their stories were so funny about this person's behavior. And we said, look, the good news is this, like when you leave this show, you will talk about the disaster week so much more than the weeks yes. that were great. Yeah. <laughs> because it's just so much funnier to remember how terrible someone was. So even though I feel bad for the audience when they watch a terrible week, just know that the writing staff and the cast will be able to dine out on that week for years. Yes. In a good way. I mean, Marcy Klein, when she was on, I guess at times she had to, like the host was having a nervous breakdown at like 11.15. I can't, I can't make it. And I she had to it. go talk it's to- It's too she much. Went, didn't want to give us names yeah. because, you know, but um, the Couldn't drama be behind that show, forget the funniness, just the drama. I don't know how many nights, I'm sure you had this experience, Seth, where I don't know if it's going to make it tonight. It seems like such a shit yeah. show. And now it's like, Almost 11 when we're going into Lauren's office, 50 of us jammed in to get notes and we're on in 28 <laughs> minutes and you keep your bald cap on. It's like a fleeny s thing. People have their, their cold opening fake nose on. I mean, it's just, it's surreal. <laughs> I feel so, I retroactively feel so terrible about, you know, because I think being a writer on the show, you sometimes forget how human the cast is because Lauren will give you, you know, again, like you said, at 1120, Lauren finally lets you out of the office and you're making changes to a cold open that's going to be on TV in 10 minutes. And then the times that I would run up to somebody like Bill Hader, who the minute he started on the show, we started leaning on him for things like impressions, uh, you know, hosts of 
news shows, yeah. which would often be the framing of the cold open. And so here's Hader doing an impression of somebody he didn't even know existed last week. And you're running up to him at 1124 saying, hey, this line's different, this line's different, this line's different. And you just, you're treating him almost like, uh, you know, a computer program and assuming he's going to be able to like process the information and deliver it because that's how it looks. Because ultimately he was so good at it. He would always make you have more confidence in him week after week after week. And then you forget all these years later, oh my God, the anxiety we were putting on that person who had to actually yeah. be the one who was on camera yeah. doing that job. I mean, you had to do it your whole time on the show, Dana. Like the amount you probably started the show with cold opens. Um, I, I, can't, I had a weird trajectory because I came in with Phil and Jan Hooks and Kevin Nealon and so forth. And then I was just happened, happened to be in the first sketch. Madonna did the cold opening on my first show, apologizing for the 85 season, like it never existed. <laughs> oh, so right, then it was right, me, right. Phil Hartman, Jan Hooks, in a, in a game show where I was a game show psychic. I knew the answer before Phil would ask the question, you know, that kind of thing. And then, yeah. and that killed, you know, cause Phil was so great and Jan and I was riding that wave. And then I, I did church chat uh, with Sigourney Weaver up and then I did chop and broccoli. So I came in, I had so much shit. My ex, manager went to the stars brad gray came into my office at like 11 20 same kind of thing and he talked like this he goes i don't know why i don't know why but it's just show it's just show tonight i don't know why it happened but it just laid out that way and uh it's very true it can go any way but when you you're forced killers. into that and i was using things for my stand-up which was helpful <laughs> i knew where the hooks were but the nerves handling the terror and the nerves, like your first, would you remember your first time you're like really crazy nervous because a sketch was leaning on you or you're doing something at update? Because an update you're talking and yeah. then the, 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 your chair pivots when you're a guest on update and you're kind of thrown out there. That's an interesting vibe as well. Yeah, I was lucky. The first update I did that landed, I got to talk as myself. I got to be Seth Meyers and I was talking, it was, uh, I was a Red Sox fan, which is true. And so sometimes when you write from truth, it's a little bit easier. And it was about how I hated the Yankees my whole life. But because of 9-11, I was rooting for the Yankees to win the World Series. But since Red Sox fans never get what they want, I had to root against the Yankees in order for them to win. the world. And so it was just, it, it made sense to me. I'd written it myself. It felt like a piece you would do in stand-up. And I remember that went great and I walked off and not to keep calling back Shoemaker, but Shoemaker met me and I've been giving him shit about this for 20 years. He goes, it'll never go that well ever again. And wow. it was like, hey, I, I thought I'd take a victory lap, but he was, you know, the reality is he wanted to remind me and probably, I don't know if you felt like you needed that reminder because that's such a monster for a show, that Scorny Weaver show. Like it must've been crazy the second week where you realized, oh, Oh, it it doesn't get no like the la the last week doesn't lead to the next. No, week. no, I was barely in the show. I think I did Casey Kasem for thirty seconds, and I think Lauren saw me at the party and kind of got, patted on the shoulder. It 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 goes up and down week to week. You just keep Brad flying, Gray you know? eleven twenty. This isn't your week. This isn't your show. <laughs> no, you ain't. Where the cards why. fell. I wanna uh, just because you mentioned her, I want to tell my favorite uh, Marcy story, which is the promos. You know, uh, the famous SNL like, hey, this week Thursday, I'm the host, and you're gonna yeah. be seeing, mm -hmm. yeah. Shit, yeah. And um, Marcy had, I had to go with Marcy into the host's room uh, to tell them about the promo. And uh, she handed this stack of promos and the host read them all and said, none of these are funny. And uh, Marcy just took the whole stack and said, well, in that case, I'll throw them in the garbage. <laughs> And just <laughs> and just dropped them in the garbage in front of the host and walked out. And I I didn't know we were allowed to talk to the host <laughs> like that. <laughs> I was in charge it of promos for two years. It's the roughest job. It was, it's the most thankless it was, yeah. garbage job. But you get to meet the host. Yeah. Um. Uh, Shoemaker has a a, a few uh, promos that Farley wrote in his office <laughs> that are really <laughs> yeah that are really funny and unusable. It will not surprise you. They are unusable. Yeah. Due I think to the I language. was there for those, and they come down. <laughs> David, I wrote some because he go. They sometimes go up to the writing room and go. Everybody, kick in a few fucking promos. Stop for a second. We need something, and then I'd gather them and go down. And then uh, there's a couple stink bombs in there from Farley. I think he'd write himself in some of them too. But they would yeah. also throw in cast room. You know, they say, hey, bring Chris down or bring in, you know, whoever they thought was funny that week to do a promo with the host. My my worst host dressing room was uh, Mick Jagger wanted just a first Ooh. joke in his monologue. 
And so Mulaney <laughs> and I had a piece of paper where we'd written 15 jokes that we collected from the writing staff about that he could say is his first joke. And our plan was just to go back and forth. And uh, I, uh, Mulaney read the first one and Mick Jagger didn't laugh. And he goes, what's the next one? <laughs> and Mulaney handed me this piece of paper and I read him the second one and he didn't laugh. And he goes, what's the next one? And I handed it back to Mulaney and there were very clearly 15 on it. And John goes, that is all we have. <laughs> because we just realized we put our favorite two first. And the fact that he had it's broken his file, we're worse. like, it's only going to get worse. He's Let's just spare like us him. all the, the yeah. embarrassment. And then you just kind of walked out or see you later, man. Yeah, we just kind of walked out and, and <laughs> said, you know, let's just go back to the drawing board. I think it's very clear that we don't have the answer on these pages. Did you ever find something that he landed and you remember it? No. I bet if we go back and watch the monologue from that show, the answer is no. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So uh, there is that thing which I know is a bummer to uh, hear, which is sometimes you just it's, it's sometimes it is, hey, it's so great to be here. Like you just have to start saying words and and let the audience know. Yeah, that this show is we. What I mean, the first update joke is very rarely the best update joke, almost because you're just trying to like pull the focus in, settle them in, and get people to pay attention. I think that the guest hosts that do uh, Q and A from the audience is maybe one of the more fail safe. Uh, I love a Q&A from the yeah, audience. Yeah. You have all those different flavors. And you get, the, yes. you get the cast to fucking act like they're in the audience. I think I wrote one for uh, Walken where he had written questions he wanted the audience to ask him. That's funny. <laughs> that was my... Where do you buy your pudding? <laughs> Sorry, read the talk. one I told you, instructed you to read before. <laughs> he ex exposes it right away. <laughs> Monologues, solo venture. Well, that's why they call him Mono One. <laughs> Just making it up. I wrote a sketch for him my first or second year, and I was a, a sketch called Pranksters, which I'm still pretty proud of. Mm. And it was one of those sketches that killed at the table, and then we got in the rewrite room, and because it had killed at the table, everybody had a lot of ideas. Uh, uh, Sometimes uh, you uh, can uh, overwrite uh, it. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. And so then we bring it out, and we're rehearsing with Walken and we get like two pages into the new version and he just stops. He goes, you ruined it. <laughs> he goes, you got to go back to the way it was. Oh, and so and we did. I mean, it was and it worked great, but he was right. We got it's that thing of sometimes, yeah. you know, you can overwrite. You can think you know, joke on a joke on a joke. It's no good. All right, before we let Seth go, Dana, ask him. Is this normal? Is this a normal amount of time? Yeah. I don't want to cut no, you short. No, I have just I'm, one I'm... question for him. But do you have one, David? Well, I was going to see who who he, who he thinks might want to take over. Who could handle that job, if if anyone? I don't think anybody can handle that job, and I'm being genuine. Yeah. Don't you think it's it's a one man? It's a one man. There's only one man. <laughs> There's only one man for the job. If you really think about the lanes that Lauren has to fill, um, it's it's pretty big. And how he resisted, oh, it's got to go to one hour. Or it should be more pre-tapes. Or you need a new theme yes. for the band. So this was decades. Anytime there was a dip in the show, he had a, um, you know, the corporate trust, whatever, Universal Now, whoever he had to talk to. And he held it steady. And now you think, God, isn't it brilliant that it just stayed branded, identical? Yes. That's why everyone we've talked to on this podcast Everyone's had the same experience, the same tiny room, the 8H, all of it. So, yeah. I mean, and that. It, it, it also, it's, yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's different. No, um, I think the other part that people forget is that Lauren's status as an icon is incredibly important based on every host that comes through those doors because everyone knows who he is. And because of that, Everyone from all walks of entertainment or politics or sports trusts him. And it only works if the host trusts him. And if it was somebody else, you know, look, it could be, you know, it could be somebody who who maybe worked on the show before or maybe was a successful producer somewhere else. But no one's going to have that cultural currency with every single person who comes in there. And also they don't act up the host because they go, this is a guy, just the respect of 50 years. And so if it's someone new, they know they sort of outrank them. Yeah. It, like they do on a movie set or something so they can sort of get away with their shenanigans. Yeah, because he knows everybody's seen it all. And the unflappable Lorne character 
which he cultivated as part of his comic persona, that he would never panic. And in the first year he was out there with a, my first few shows, he'd had a glass of Chardonnay on 8-H. This show's going on in between sketches. Oh, this has to breathe. So I guess he has a calming effect to a host. Yeah. You'll do this and it'll be great. You're going to be happy at the party. And, you know, he's very good at public relations. It's also, I, I think when I hosted, and at this point, I feel like I knew Lauren as well as you could know him. Mm -hmm. And I remember right before a sketch, he sort of walked over. And I thought, oh, this is going to be this new experience with Lauren. I'm going to find out what is it that he says to hosts right before sketches start. Because that's the one thing I'd never been privy to, despite all the time. I spent. And he walked over and he said some version of, and just walked away. Like literally <laughs> barely a word. <laughs> just just a sort of a nod. And I was like, that is part of his, you know, part of his uh, enduring uh, you know, talents in this field is is sometimes knowing uh, when not to say anything, mm -hmm. and I think very few people have it in 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 power in show business. Very people know uh, how how sometimes saying less is more. Uh, this sketch has to breathe. That's right before you're starting. Seth, let's not yeah. fuck this up. I I this is one of my uh, my last show because I stayed through about halfway through uh my last season uh, before i left and i wrote it was the super bowl episode and i wrote a sketch uh for melissa mccarthy where she had ordered a bunch of wings for a super bowl party and they it was very obvious there was no one at her house but she was pretending she was pretending to yell at people off camera to explain why she had these like three trains of chicken wings and um i was under the bleachers with lauren and it just it just played to silence, oh my and uh, and Lauren, when it was over, looked at me and goes, uh, and again, this is my last show, and I, I'd been there, you know, 12 and a half years, it was a long time, and he looked at me and goes, what am I going to do without you? <laughs> <laughs> just, That's a great <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also, my favorite, uh, I think my favorite uh, Under the Bleachers, uh, it's a Love It story. When you hosted, Dana, mm -hmm. Love It's came to the yes. show. Do you yeah. remember oh, that? Yeah. You need yeah. me? And uh, he, he, was, he, was a, he was such a dream uh, in the same way that it was a dream to uh, spend a week uh, working and writing uh, with Dana. And also, let me, let me note, uh, Sean Penn's Celebrity Roast was a sketch I wrote when you were there, uh, uh, Spade. Oh, that was I, I Owen Wilson? You were Owen Wilson. Yeah. That is a, a, a real feather it's in my cap one. as well. Great one. It was a great one. But um, Lovitz uh, walked underneath the bleachers right before the show started and goes, <laughs> started shaking all the hands goes John Lovitz John Lovitz John Lovitz and then he turned to Lauren and went and you are yeah. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. he loved it's his favorite thing dinging Lauren in the you know when you would pitch ideas you know for an hour on Monday and the host is sitting there and everyone's pitching and then uh, the very end John would always go Lauren what are your ideas? You know, I go, John. Why are you trying to disturb he our our boss? My, uh, I was there for Will Ferrell's final show because we overlapped for one year, and the last pitch, Will brought in an old typewriter, and every time while people pitched, he was typing as if it was his job to write them all down, and it was this really loud typewriter, so people would pitch and be like. <laughs> And you know, there's so few laughs in pitch. On, on <laughs> no, shit. So it's just this Intensive. really loud, and he would go, and Will went last um, at pitch, <laughs> and it went all the way around, and then Lauren says, Will, and Will just basically like rolls up the paper on the way you do on typewriter, he's and then he just very quietly <laughs> reads through everything he typed, and he said, no, I think we're good. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> see, I never got that comfortable to do something, but I love that yeah. Will has that looseness to yeah. him to just do that, you know. Yeah, I, I was just the show always had some anxiety to it. Uh, some, yeah, that some. idea. I never, yeah, a bit in Lauren's uh room oh, in front mm. of the host, you don't know. Yeah, that would be hard. So, Zeth, you're going back. Um, you're going to do the show. It's the Yeah, I don't know when when this will air, but we will be back doing shows again. I'm going to start in and a couple of days. And it's the craziest, just for a second, the craziest uh, political environment ever, uh, I think. 
I mean, they say it every time, yeah. but say kind of the craziest. So yeah. how are, are, are you to look forward to it? How are you going to manage it? I mean, you do the closer looks, you do your comedy. Yeah, and, I mean, huh. it's really nice because the closer look is this thing that we sort of built that can kind of hold anything. Mm -hmm. And so we don't need any one kind of news to know we have a show. Mm -hmm. We sort of have this bucket that we can fill with whatever we want. And I would certainly rather live in, in boring times, don't get me wrong, but it is processing the anxiety is easier with a show mm -hmm. than just walking around muttering to myself in the streets. So I'm happy to be back with other people that uh, also think it's fucking crazy. One crazy. of my writers, uh, Sal Gentile, who's, who writes A Closer Look, uh, described our show as uh, written for and by the formerly sane. And we try to keep that as, as the way we approach things. How are you, I mean, because everything is like, we have these two horses in the race. Trump, yes. and he's got his indictments and he's Trump. And then we have Biden, who even in the Washington Post, New York Times, they're kind of going, uh, uh, what's, uh, hello, uh, is everything okay over there? You know, so how do you navigate that? Have you done a closer look on current Biden? Because when he first came out, I didn't really know how to get an angle on him at all, but now he's more interesting. It's yeah, it's really, it's sort of day to day, but I think that as we get closer and we get more into you know, um, debate the type stuff. Is, yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously it, it kind of goes without saying it'll be him. And, and so there won't be a situation where we have, um, you know, uh, it's obviously not going to be a democratic primary season. And it was interesting for us last time, but then fascinating how quickly it became a Biden show. Yeah. I thought that we were going to have 10 democratic candidates and it would go on until the very, you know, I certainly thought it would be a super Tuesday situation. It was nuts that it was sort of over by South Carolina. Right. So we have, that sort of then takes your focus on it because there, you know, Biden, other than, um, you know, uh, the general, he hasn't been a part of a horse race for, for years. And, and back when he was in horse races, he was never close enough to be considered, uh, you know, a front runner. It's funny how little he, uh, even appeared, I guess, 88 when, uh, who was playing, who played Biden uh, in your era? In 88, I, I, boy, I wonder wow. if I was assigned Bush. I, I don't know who would have done him. He may have dropped out soon enough that we didn't do him. Yeah, I yeah. never had to. I mean, I just remember Stockdale. Dacus <laughs> did him in 2010. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, Suds. I used to write those for Suds. Suds was a great, it's funny because- Suds. You know, Suds, and we call them Suds. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Suds did- He had did a funny them, take and it on was a, Biden. Yeah. Very fun. I, you know, I, w I would do this on stage that I think that when, again, I didn't think he was going to be the nominee, that like when he ran for president <laughs> in 2020, that Obama must have thought, you, wait, you thought my vice president wasn't the last job you were ever going to have? Like you thought, <laughs> you thought it was a stepping stone job? <laughs> Joe, Joe, um, you don't have to do this, Joe. Joe, you don't have to do it. No, 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 no. But I, I, what I did was I looked at the town halls because I looked at him in 2012 in his debate, uh, vice presidential debate with, yeah. with what's his name? Paul Ryan. And, Paul um, Ryan. you know, he was, he was pretty, he was, he was pretty strong. You know, he was, he was. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in the town halls, he just had different rhythms, different stories, a, a different kind yeah. of attitude. But um, it's very interesting. It's such a hot oven out there. And I, my style is to do, I do both. I'll do Trump. And my Trump, I think all of our Trumps got a little better because of James Austin Johnson, who made it into so like good. jazz. I mean, it's, he, yeah. he's got breathing techniques. I mean, his, his Trump yeah. is crazy brilliant. And so, and your Trump, your Trump has gotten really, really good because I saw it Thank recently. Thank you. And what did what did I try to? I try not to think about it at all. I try to just let Trump speak through me. Uh, what, which I what's feel like. Your, I, what's your hook into Trump? Do you have a? Because I always uh, mine is that he always sounds like he's pitching a family vacation. We're going to be going <laughs> things the way you won't believe. We're going to do it, and people say no, but we're going to do it anyway. You know all that kind of stuff. So you, I like the one that we keep coming back to is that uh, big guy, strong guy. Tears in his eyes like that. <laughs> you know, these makeup stories about sort of uh, it's always, uh, you know, vague, amorphous people, but they're always very big, very strong and very, <laughs> very emotional about how much they miss him. And I, uh, I love I, there's I, that, so many that, hits that he has. Like He's a stone cold loser. Is, is a great one. A <laughs> I like a lot of people loser. are saying, I haven't heard anything. No, what a, a beauty. Not a 10, not a 10. She's not my type. I mean, he has like a million. <laughs> 
Trump he's deeply funny. He is, is deeply, 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 deeply funny. funny. The Biden thing, the only thing that made me laugh was when he does the whispering, because the rich That's don't good. pay the fair share, and then he goes really loud, because I know how to be down. It's just, <laughs> I can't believe it's not butter. So that whisper <laughs> to the yell was the hook that got me. It was really good. You can, the first time I saw you do the, the whisper thing I, on Colbert, it was a real like, ah, that's it. My Fuck. dad lost that's his it. job. No joke. <laughs> Not getting around here. <laughs> no right. joke. No number joke. Number one, the two part, number two, three. But you know what? We're all in this ecosystem. So run with anything. I'm just. I remember uh, I remember 2012 that you mentioned the vice presidential debate. And in those years, I would. Yeah. Paul Ryan. I would yeah. write. Uh, I would write sort of a template debate sketch, but then everybody would pitch in based on having watched the debate. And, and I remember my phone rang and. It was Downey, the aforementioned Jim Downey. Yeah. Uh, you know, former head writer, uh, legendary SNL uh, staff member. And he had this bit that made it in, which was my favorite bit of that debate, which was how Biden kept talking about Scranton and how he's from Scranton, but made yeah. Scranton sound like a super shitty place. And it was just <laughs> like, I'm from Scranton. Hard, this is a backwater. These are hard scrabble people. You, you, you. You drive through Scranton, roll up your windows. And it was just a really <laughs> yeah. funny, downy observation that that Biden talked about his hometown, both from a point of pride and also like never fucking go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, he tells a story recently, I think it was kind of funny that he, you know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm eight years old and I see two men on the street, Scranton, Pennsylvania, they're kissing. I asked my pops, what's, what's that? And he, my pop says, that's love. That's just love, son. A teamster from 1953 talking like that. <laughs> it feels very woke. I don't know, but you know. Yeah. Uh, God love him. God uh, love him. God, right. God love him. Well, uh, God bless yeah. America. Thank so, you, Seth. So, Seth, thanks for coming on. You're uh, a key piece of Saturday Night Live history. This is where I go into my, um, you know, an amazing run on Saturday Night Live. And, you know, one of the very few people is just, where are you going to work? Rockefeller Center, which is a magic building, yep. you know, magic it place. Is. Lucky. It's you where know. Kenny Amon worked. Oh yeah, the great hey, Kenny, uh, shoemaker. Hey, please say hello and I will. Um, congratulations on just having a cool show yeah. to go to. Uh, thanks, guys. Yeah. Come back, come visit us soon. Now that we're going to be come back in doing that it. hot seat again, I'm going to get in the hot get seat. Get in the fucking hot seat. Right. And I'm going to and I'm going to just go crazy. I'm going to go completely just unusable. Like, just go, Unusable. Unusable. No, no, Cut just go down. super high energy and just like, rather than kind of lean into my age, I'm just going to like get some. Five hundred and just go nuts. I'm just telling you now. Just, Can't wait. Okay. <laughs> Good to see All you guys. guys. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for for having me, guys. This has been a podcast presentation of Cadence Thirteen. Please listen, then rate, review, and follow all episodes. Available now for free wherever you get your podcast. No joke, folks. Fly on the Wall has been a presentation of Cadence 13, executive produced by Dana Carvey and David Spade, Chris Corcoran of Cadence 13, and Charlie Finan of Brillstein Entertainment. The show's lead producer is Greg Holtzman with production and engineering support from Serena Regan and Chris Basil of Cadence 13. 